what's up everybody? Thank y'all for tuning in for another episode of Toyzilla Streams Book Club, The Looking Glass Wars by Frank Bretton. <laughs> That's the book we're doing right now. Um, for those of you who are just now tuning in, this has been going on for a while. We're starting on chapter 22 today, so if you haven't read the previous chapters, you can find them on our YouTube page. Look for a Toyzilla. Look for our bear bot symbol. It's, it's all over the place. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just to give ourselves a proper introduction again. The Looking Glass Wars is a part of a trilogy. And I'm hoping we can do all three books. But for right now, just to give ourselves something to do, we're focusing on the one. It's a fractured fairy tale about Alice in Wonderland. Uh, again, you know, when people take other stories and they... Put a new spin on them, putting their own view. And so far, I'm really liking it. So in today's stream, we're going to do chapters 22, 23, and 24. While reading, if you guys want to do some artwork and, you know, about what you're listening to and you want to send it in and have me show it on this stream, just let me know. Put your post underneath the video that you want to, and then I'll let you guys know where to send it to. Other than that, you know... There's really no pictures in the book. Like, few pictures in the book. My pictures. Not a lot of pictures. Let's help, you know, bring a little bit of fun into it. Make it interactive, book club. But all right now, let's go ahead and get started. See what's happening to Alice the Hatter and <coughs> little Dodge Anders. <laughs> all right, let's get down to it, y'all. Here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 22. Hatter put one foot in the puddle, but the sole of his shoe never touched the bottom. He tumbled down, falling deeper and deeper until he stopped and floated in the depths, only to shoot up again as fast as his descent had been. When he broke the surface, he was in the pool of tears. The clouds above swirled violently and the water was rough and choppy. He swam to the crystal shore, his senses alive to any sign of red at her hordes. He climbed out of the water and stealthily approached the nearest tree, a beaten old thing with a scarred trunk and leafless, craggy branches. Has Princess Alice returned to Wonderland? Have you seen her come out of the pool? Princess Alice is dead, the tree said loudly, as if for the benefit of an unseen but all-hearing force liable to inflict great hurt at the slightest provocation. I have no evidence of her death. Princess Alice Hart is dead, the tree said louder than ever, but added in a whisper. Red's glass eyes are everywhere. It's dangerous to talk. The princess has not returned. Hatter didn't know what the, what the glass eyes were. Red had only recently unleashed them on the queen. Uh, Red had only recently unleashed them on the queendom, but he wasn't going to stick around to find out. As long as he had strength in him, his duty dictated that he return to the other world and search for the princess. He would find her, train her in the ways of a warrior queen, as he had her mother. Then they could both come home to face plenty of trouble. The glass eyes being only part of it. He dived back into the pool of tears, the gravity of the portal already growing more familiar to him, pulling him down. Likewise, more familiar to him was the pause in the deep, the momentary suspension, followed by the heart and mouth filling as he rocketed up and out of the puddle behind a milking shed on the outskirts of Budapest, Hungary. Three unimpressed goats were the only earthly creatures to see the figure twirl out of a sudden scorch, out of a sun-scorched puddle, and land confidently on his feet. Haddon wondered whether he could learn to navigate the Pulitiers as he did the Crystal Continuum, so that he might be able to choose his earthly destination. Control would be more difficult to attain than it was in the Continuum. Water was a heavy medium. To maneuver in it would require skill, Balance, endurance, strength of body, and mind. 
But these were considerations for another day, another year. Because Hatter's worldwide search for Alice now began in earnest. Whew. <clears throat> he trailed people alight with the glow of imagination, believing that one of them would lead him to Wonderland's princess, who couldn't fail to glow in this world. He visited hat shops in the towns and cities of Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, Bavaria, Italy, Prussia, Greece, Poland, to name but several. In 1864, five years into his search, having twice circled the European continent, he took the Callis Ferry to Dover, England. Had Alice's Adventures in Wonderland been published by the time he arrived, any one of the salespeople in the hat shops and haberdasheries he visited would have been stung with recognition upon hearing the name Princess Alice Hart of Wonderland issue from his lips, though they might have thought him mad, a man in search of a fictional character. As it was, they only tried to sell him hats he didn't need while complimenting him on the one he wore. Hatter would be far from England a year later when Charles Dodgson's book was first published. As he roamed the world in search of Wonderland's princess, maps sticking out of every available pocket, worn from use and much scribbled on with notes of where he'd been and what routes he'd taken, Hatter's legend grew. Though the languages in which it was told varied as widely as the terrain he covered, ranging from Africans to Hindi to Japanese to Welsh, and the details of the story often changed, its basic premise was the same. A solitary man, blessed with fear, <clears throat> a solitary man blessed with fear, some physical abilities, and armed with a curious assemblage of weaponry, crossed continents on a mysterious quest that led him to headwear merchants the world over, whether a peddler of knitted caps operating from a tent in a North African Bedouin encampment, or an exclusive hat shop in the heart of Prague. Hatter sightings were reported in, in America, which was nearing the end of the Civil War, glimpses of him stalking streets in New York and Massachusetts, tramping the snow-covered hills of Vermont, the icy roads of Delaware, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine. He traveled down through Mexico and South America, skirted the Antarctic Peninsula, and circled back up to California and Oregon. He passed into Canada and eventually made his way to the Asian countries and the Far East. Then... In the third week of April, 1872, 13 years after he lost Alice, Hatcher entered a shop in a crowded bazaar in Egypt in the shadow of the Great Pyramid of Giza. I'm looking for Princess Alice Hart of Wonderland, he said to the shopkeeper. I'm a member of Wonderland's millinery, and any information you have pertaining to Princess Alice will be highly appreciated and, in due time, rewarded. He had uttered these exact words so many times and not once met with success that a normal man would have given up on their power to provoke a, meanly, a meaningful response. The truth was, he didn't expect the shopkeeper to have any information, so he, surprised, so he was so surprised when the man beckoned him toward a high shelf where a book was leaning between a miniature sink carved out of sandstone and a basket of dried camel tongues. The man dusted it with his sleeve and handed it to Hatter. It was an English edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Her name was misspelled, but Wonderland? Surely it was his Alice. How could it be anyone else? The girl in the illustrations looked nothing like her, and yet it could not be coincidence. Hatter's future path had become clear. To find Alice, he would first have to find the book's author, Lewis Carell. <laughs> Maybe I'm pronouncing that name wrong, too. I don't know. Y'all let me know. Y'all edumacate me. <laughs> Chapter 23. <clears throat> Bullet-like, Dodge raced headlong through the kaleidoscope glitter of the crystal continuum. Yeehaw! Woo! Wonderland is surely 
wanted to get out of his way were sucked up through crystal byways and reflected out of looking glasses into seedy restaurants or the homes of strangers, looking glasses out of which they had never meant to be reflected on their way to other destinations. Yeah, 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 Dodge shouted. Come on! Four glass eyes were chasing him. They looked like ordinary Wonderlanders except for the implants of reflective colorless crystal in their eye sockets. An artificial race with enhanced sight, strength, and speed. Glass eyes were built for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they patrolled the crystal continuum with orders to annihilate anyone suspected of being an Allison. Their patrols had effectively limited rebel mobility, all but choked off a major channel for rebel communications. Handheld looking glass communicators had never been viable for anything but short cryptic intelligence reports as dispatches could be intercepted by anyone at any time. The most effective means of sending and retrieving sensitive Allison intelligence had been to use portal runners to traverse the, crin the crystal continuum, but that was before the glass eyes. Now being a portal runner meant dying sooner rather than later. Portal runs were one step removed from suicide missions. Dodge Anders had made more puddle runs than any Allison, and he always volunteered to deliver the most important messages, warnings, and intel updates. The occasion for this run, Red's troops had been active and General Doppelganger suspected an impending attack on an Allison outpost situated in the Snark Mountain foothills. The outpost had to be warned. Shwoop! Dodge flew through the continuum the glass eyes gaining on him. These contests of navigational skill and strength were the only times he felt anything even approaching happiness. It didn't matter that he might be killed. He was being useful and it made him feel that much closer to exacting his revenge. In front of him, the continuum splintered in many directions. He threw his body weight to the left and made a sharp turn at the last minute. He looked behind him. One of the glass eyes hadn't made the turn. Three more to go, and he had to lose them quick before others joined the chase. Spinning to avoid the glass eyes' gunfire, Dodge removed his sword from its scabbard and held it firmly with both hands. With a great effort of will, he came to a sudden stop. The glass eyes weren't expecting it, came rushing upon him, and the front runner impaled himself on Dodge's sword. Before the two remaining glass eyes could regain their equilibrium, Dodge relaxed, surrendered his body to the pool of the nearest looking glass, and was sucked up out of the continuum, reflected out of a glass in the lobby of an apartment building. In less time than it took to a galloping spirit dame to make a single stride, he pressed himself flat against the wall next to the looking glass. The glass eyes flew out of it and passed him. He smashed the glass with the handle of his sword. As fragments of mirrors scattered and fell, Dodge squeezed his entire body back into the continuum through a reflective sliver no larger than a Jabberwock's toe. A feat the glass eyes hadn't mastered, for when they tried, they couldn't get their entire bodies into the continuum, only those parts that had been reflected in the fragment. Zooming through the looking glass's fast disappearing crystalline byway, the void racing up behind him, Dodge looked back a final time and saw one glass eye with half a face, a shoulder, and little else, the other with a head and torso, but no arms. The glass eyes had no strength that were swallowed by the void. He too would have become part of the nothingness if he hadn't hooked up with the continuum's main artery when he did. Dodge continued on his way, heading for a certain looking glass not far from Snark Mountain. He emerged from the continuum and made the rest of the journey on foot but the joy he'd felt during the chase quickly vanished. He had reverted to his usually tightly contained self by the time he arrived to warn the leader of the Allison outpost of a possible attack from Red. Mission completed. What now? He could head back to the Everlasting Forest, but all he'd probably find there would be General Doppelganger and the others sitting around talking strategy. Anything was better than just sitting around. So he risked an extra portal run, emerged near the whispering woods, and passed through them to the Pool of Tears. He came here every once in a while, stood on the cliff overlooking the pool, thinking about the life that had happened to him. Like his father, he had once believed in the principles of white imagination, 
love, justice, and duty to others, but he knew better now. An adherence to higher principles got nowhere in this realm. It was not as his father had preached, its own reward. What sort of reward allowed others to conquer and murder and do away with all you held dear? He had been reckless to come to the pool, shouldn't have taken the unnecessary risk. He had to stay alive. His vengeance required it. Chapter 24. Mm -mm -mm. Alice worked hard to enter into the world in which she found herself and refused to see Dodgeton whenever he came to the house. Pained by her refusals, he came with less and less frequency until he ceased coming altogether. The book he'd written for her was published for the public's enjoyment under the title Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. It was widely known that Alice's fantastic stories had served as its inspiration, fodder for poking fun at her, if ever there was, but so well had she adapted to the customs and beliefs of the time, so well had she adopted the inclinations of other girls her age that she befriended those who used to tease her mercilessly. And although Mrs. Liddell never discovered the cause for Alice's tantrum that fateful afternoon at the River Sherwell, she was more than pleased with her daughter's behavior ever since. Far from being flattered by Dodgson's silly scribblings, it was as if they had brought home to Alice as nothing else had been able to, just how inane all her Wonderland talk had been. She distanced herself from the book and its author, and Mrs. Liddell took this to mean that she was finally growing up, which indeed she was. Beginning in her 16th year, while on Sunday strolls along High Street with her mother and sisters, it was as the wardens of Charing Cross had predicted. Young men of rank paused in appreciation as Alice Pass took pains to learn who she was, invited her to parties where they did their best to impress her with their wit and knowledge of worldly affairs. They did not find Miss Liddell lacking in intelligence. Some perhaps even found her a bit too intelligent. She was a thoughtful, well-read young woman with opinions on a variety of topics such as the responsibility that came with Britain's military power, the nature of commerce and industry under a monarchy, how to care for the poor and neglected, the sensationalist tendencies of the Fleet Street papers, and the convolutions of the legal system as exposed as exposed by the eminent author Charles Dickens. Many well-to-do dandies, even those uncomfortable with any women who appeared smarter than themselves, thought it unfortunate that she'd been adopted. It meant that they could never marry her. Of course, these fellows took it for granted that Miss Liddell would have considered herself lucky to marry any one of them. But she was not easily impressed, nor prone to fall in love. The vicissitudes of her life had caused her to keep her feelings for others in check. It was dangerous to care for people. Inevitably, you got hurt. She talked with young men. <clears throat> she talked with young men. Accepted their invitations to parties and galas but more because it pleased her mother than because of any affection for the men themselves. The Reverend Dodgson published a sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, entitled Through the Looking Glass. Again, his scribblings met with popular success. Alice herself did not read the book, but not long before its publication, and against her wishes, she found herself in the same room with its author. Oxford was not big town, Oxford was not a big town, and she'd often seen Dodgson in the street or crossing the college grounds, but she had taken care not to get caught in conversation with them. She would offer a word of greeting as good manners required, but that was all. Alice's 18th birthday having passed, Mrs. Liddell thought it time to document for prosperity the young woman her daughter had become. 
She wanted Alice to sit for a photographic portrait, and she asked Dodgson to be the photographer. <sighs> Mother, please. You know I don't wish to see him, Alice said. A lady might not like a man. A, a lady might not like a man, Mrs. Littletail said, but she shouldn't show it so explicitly as you do. So Alice agreed to sit for the portrait. On the appointed day, she heard Dodgson into the house and began setting up his equipment in the parlor. Detestable man. How can you not understand what you did to me? Should I forgive? I can't. I can't. Must be polite, but be quick about it. Get in and get out. Alice could not completely... Alice could not completely hide her feelings, and when Mrs. Liddell called her down, she moved with the briskness of one overburdened with appointments. Good afternoon, Mr. Mr. Dodgson, she said, and fell into the chair. <laughs> she slumped there, hands in her lap, head tilted toward her right shoulder, as she eyed Dodgson from under her darkened brow until, as fast as he could. Her behavior made him uncomfortable. He took the picture. Then she heaved herself out, out of the chair. Thank you, sir, she said, looking not at him, but over his head as she left the room. By Alice's 20th year, Mrs. Liddell was becoming anxious for her to choose a husband from among her many suitors. But I don't feel anything for a single one of them, Alice complained shaking her head to fling out the unwanted memory of a boy left behind long ago. Don't think of him. I mustn't. Then, one Saturday, the Liddell family attended an outdoor concert by a quartet at Christ Church Meadow. They were about to take their seats when a young gentleman, under the pretense of introducing himself to Dee Liddell, approached. He was Prince Leopold, Queen Victoria's youngest son, and he had been sent to Christ Church so that Dean Liddell might oversee his education. This was his first time meeting the family. Mrs. Liddell became fidgety and excited as she was introduced. <laughs> and these ladies, said Dean Liddell, presenting his daughters, are Edith, Lorena, and Alice. Girls, say hello to Prince Leopold. <laughs> Alice held out her hand for the prince to kiss He seemed reluctant to let it go I'm afraid you can't keep it, your highness She said And when he didn't understand My hand I may have use for it still <laughs> Ah, well If I must return it to you, then I must Though if it ever needs safe keeping <laughs> I shall think of you, your highness. <laughs> Prince Leopold insisted that the Liddells sit with him. He placed himself between Alice and Mrs. Liddell, and when the concert began with a Mozart melody, he leaned over and whispered in Alice's ear. I don't fancy medleys. They skip lightly over so many works without delving thoroughly onto any one of them. There are quite a few people like that as well, Alice whispered in return. Mrs. Liddell, not hearing the exchange, flashed her daughter a look, which Alice was at a loss to interpret. The prince talked to her through the entire concert, discussing everything from arts to politics. He found Mrs. Liddell unlike other young women, who spoke of nothing but velvet draperies, wallpaper patterns, and the latest fashions, Women who batted their eyelashes and expected him to swoon. Miss Liddell didn't try to impress him. Indeed, she gave him the impression that she didn't much care what he thought of her, and he rather admired that. And her beauty. <laughs> yes, her beauty was undeniable. All in all, he thought her a delectable puzzle of a creature. No sooner was the concert over that Leopold gone than Mrs. Liddell voiced that she'd been trying to communicate to Alice with her eyes. He's a prince! A prince! And he's taken a fancy to you! I'm certain. We were only talking, Mother. 
I talk to him as I would have talked to anyone. <laughs> but her mother's awe and enthusiasm were difficult to ignore, and she started running into Leopold all over town. If she strolled through the Christchurch picture gallery, she found him gazing intently at an oil painting by one of the old masters. If she visited the Bordeon Library, she found him thumbing through a volume of Gibbons, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which she had read in its entirety. He's handsome enough, I suppose, and obviously well-bred. Yes, but so were many of the men who vied for her attention. At least he didn't stroke his mustache with impatience as she talked of the need to provide for Britain's poor. A nation should be judged on how it looks after its more unfortunate children, she explained. If Great Britain is truly to be the greatest kingdom in the world, it is not enough to flaunt our military power and our dominance in the industry. We must lead by example and be more char charitable to and protective of our own. Prince Leopold always listened to her judiciously, weighing her arguments and reasonings with seriousness. He never agreed or disagreed with her. Mother may be right. I could certainly do worse than marry a prince. But although Alice tried to feel something for the man, her heart remained unconvinced. Three months after the concert at Christ Church Meadow, while taking a stride in his carriage to Boris Hill, Prince Leopold said, Your father tells me that you'll be visiting the Banbury Orphanage tomorrow afternoon. I'd like to come along if you'll have me. One never knows what sort of troubles might be set a young woman there. If you think it for the best, your highness. He offered to take her in the carriage, but Alice said that she preferred to walk. You see so much more of the town than you walk. A little curiosity shop or a snatch of garden where you wouldn't think it possible to have a garden. Choked as it is by city things. And a carriage, you hurry past these treasures without noticing them. She didn't take the slightest quirk of mankind for granted, but viewed it as a small miracle and cause for celebration. And the prince had begun to love her for this. At Banbury, the orphans crowded around Alice, hugging her skates, all shouting at once. Alice laughed, held full conversations simultaneously, and, to Leopold's eye, set off against the suit-stained walls, the drab and loose-hanging clothes of the orphans, and the pale, bloodless faces of the wardens. She looked more radiant than he'd ever seen her. On a tour of the orphanage, a train of children followed her at their heels. One young boy refused to let go of Alice's left thumb. Alice requested a thorough accounting of the troubles facing the Banbury Orphanage. The wardens pointed out floors rotten from overflowing sewage, the sagging infirmary roof, the time-worn mattresses as thin as wafers. They showed her the pantry, empty save for sacks of dried kidney beans and uncooked rice. The children have had nothing but beans and rice for two weeks, one of the women told her. We were supposed to be getting a supply of beef ribs, but so far, nothing. This sort of thing happens rather frequently, I'm afraid. Prince Leopold had been silent for some time. He cleared his throat. What if the warden responsible for ensuring that Banbury receives the food and the clothes the children need? The chief warden is very selective as to who gets what and, I'll, and how much of it, Your Highness, the warden explained. He says, we take in too many children and that perhaps they are not so deserving. For example, that one there, the one pointed at the boy holding on to Alice's thumb. He has a real talent for thieving, though often it's not what he steals is food because of how hungry he is. They all are. She gestured at the surrounding orphans. Alice looked at the boy clutching her thumb, suddenly reminded of Quigley Gaffer. What's become of him and the others? Andrew, Margaret, and Francine were hardly old enough to dress themselves, never mind living on the streets without the love and support of family. <laughs> the mournful fairway looked on Alice's face and a profound effect on the prince. I shall talk with the queen, he said after several moments. I think we might establish a commission of inquiry into the matter and, in the meantime, arrange for an increase in food rations. How does that sound? 
It sounds like generosity rarely met with among the living, said the woman. Well, no one here shall soon discover if it's to be met with among the dead either, if I can help it. The orphans blinked and said nothing, hardly believing what they had heard. Queen Victoria and Prince Leopold were going to work on their behalf? The wardens offered the prince their thanks many times over, while Alice looked on and smiled, which was all the thanks he desired. Mm, excuse me. <laughs> Let's continue. <clears throat> <clears throat> on the walk home, they stopped to the rest. Yeah. On the walk home, they stopped to rest in the university's botanic garden, where Alice found herself sitting on a bench with Leopold suddenly kneeling in front of her. No matter what you decide, Alice, he was saying. I want you to know that in the coming years, I will be only too glad to assist you in your charitable endeavors, but I hope with all my heart that you'll allow me to do so as your husband. Alice didn't understand. I'm asking for your hand in marriage, Leopold explained. But, your highness, are you sure? That is not exactly the answer for which I was hoping. Alice, you are a most uncommon commoner, to say the least, and I would be proud to call myself your husband. Of course, you realize that you will not have the title of princess, nor be entitled to ownership of the royal estates. Of course. Marriage. Again, she felt the tug of a long, buried affection for one whom she would not allow herself to think of him. She had to be realistic. The marriage would please her mother. She would do it for her mother, for her family's sake. I accept, Leopold. She let herself be kissed, feeling the coolness of dust settle in around her. I have already spoken with the queen, and I have asked for and received your father's blessing, the prince said. We shall host a party to announce the engagement. If she had time to think about it, Alice might have stopped herself considering the idea too whimsical, but the words had a force of their own, and only after she said them aloud did she realize just how appropriate the idea was. Let's have a masquerade. Yes, it felt right. A masquerade to celebrate the orphan girl's impending marriage to Prince Leopold of Great Britain. Oh, how exciting was that, y'all? Oh, that was the end of chapter 24. Chapter 24, we meant to go that far, right? 22, 23, 24? Yeah, we did. <laughs> oh, I just can't wait to see what happens next. All right, y'all, y'all know the business. If while reading, y'all found yourselves encased in artistic muse, draw pictures. Let's see how this story actually looks inside of your mind's eye and post them underneath the video so we can, you know, share them with everybody. We'll be reading again next week. Our streaming days are Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is when we start our gaming most likely more Crash Bandicoot and Fall Guys for now. And then after that, a few chapters of The Looking Glass Wars. Again, always in their separate videos. But you know, if you don't come around for the stream, I do post the videos on YouTube. Search Toyzilla and look for that Bear by logo, my friends. Alright, until next time, this has been Toyzilla. Remember, if you like what you see, you turn down your PC and mute it. <laughs> Oh, man, I love saying that. It also shows my age. Uh, y'all y'all got to forgive me. I'm be silly. All right, everybody. Y'all have a good night and be safe out there. Your girl Toyzilla is out. Bye, bye.